All right, welcome everybody. Uh, this is our <laughs> la last midweek program of the year. Mm. So we'll be starting back up again uh, in the new year, uh, which, is, which is pretty exciting. We, somebody gave me the number of these that we've done mm. so far, mm. and it is a lot. I can't remember the number, but just came up the other day. You, don't check it. 121. 121 wow. that, that we've done. Um, which has been pretty exciting. Um, and those of you who've joined us on this uh, fourth Wednesday of the month recently with uh, for our garden conversations, you know, we bring in people who, um, who have different experiences in horticulture and different perspectives, and we just let the conversation go where it will. I've had some of our guests have said, okay, you know, should I come prepared with anything? And I said, ah, no, I, I won't try to throw you for a loop. Um, and this is somebody who I could not throw for a loop at all. Oh, um, I don't know about that. As Blake mentioned, uh, Bryce Lane uh, was the host of In the Garden with Bryce, uh, three-time Emmy Award winner. Uh, so pretty impressive with that. Also uh, has been um, a lecturer, undergraduate coordinator, um, mentor for horticulture students at NC State University for quite a long time. I won't I won't dox him. He can he can say how many years. <laughs> he is nominally retired, which means <laughs> he only teaches a few classes for the university and then spends the rest of his time teaching classes with us. So if, if you have had a class with Bryce, you know, and if you haven't, um, you're really missing out on one of the, what I, I think is one of the greatest garden communicators um, oh my goodness. we've ever had. And, and I would say that NC State University horticulture students that um, Bryce has has done more uh, to inspire them, move them, get them into horticulture. He he would teach some service classes that were for everybody in the universities, you know, and all of a sudden they'd have to call their parents and say, yeah, mom, I'm switching out of pre-law or business and going into horticulture. Uh, but I'm sure they wound up happier than ever. So Bryce, welcome. Well, thank you, Mark. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, you know, Blake made it sound for a minute there, he made it sound like I, I'm very rarely in the garden here. <laughs> at the Rolston Arboretum, and so I was gonna take issue with that, Blake, but uh, maybe maybe at this time of year, I'm not as much. But, this time uh, of day, out yeah, when it's this out time about, day. you're here that's in the right. evening that's teaching right. classes. That's right, that's right. So anyway, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. This is this is a, a great, great activity. You know, it's fascinating, Mark. The, um, the pandemic has really provided us with a, a, a new, uh, lots of new opportunities to communicate our, our love for for horticulture, for plants, and for gardening, and and so you know these types of programs um, are able to reach people all over the all, all over the community and and uh, and beyond, uh, which um, has really I think um, helped to infuse some more some more interest in in gardening and plants. Um, I think our biggest challenge though is uh, how do we keep them? You know, yeah. I you remember the pandemic. All these people started gardening, and and then after that first year they lost interest. Yeah, that's, you know, I, I, I think we, we probably kept some of them. We were talking about oh, yeah. birding earlier. My wife right. became an avid birder and now she's a, a casual birder, <laughs> but she has more of an appreciation than she did right. before. Right. But yeah, so I mentioned, I say Bryce is a great communicator and along those lines with COVID, we were doing all of these, like these midweek programs, 100% online. And as we started coming back and wanted to do hybrid programs, we of course reached out to Bryce because we knew that, that Bryce would figure out how to do it and teach <laughs> us how to do it so that we could continue it on. And, and I think that's what makes has made Bryce uh, such a, a great, other than his enthusiasm and knowledge, is the embrace of, of the new. What's the next yeah. thing out there? It's not, you don't rail against the fact that there's change. You say, yeah. change is inevitable. Yeah. How, do I, how do I best use it? Well, you know, it's interesting too because um, you know, COVID comes along and I find myself sitting, you know, in my sunroom um, every Monday night for two hours and then some um, teaching those classes. And I don't know that we really understood what would be the next, you know, that next step when it came to communicating um, uh, an education, not just in the gardening realm, but higher education, even grade school. So that's all changed. But, um, you know, it's what's, what's really, and folks, what you can really be thankful for is 
you know, I appreciate the comments about communication, but I think that um, the forward thinking that y'all at the Arboretum have about how we can get this message out, how we can educate, and on a broader scale has led to the idea of, you know, these hybrid classes, which, um, you know, it's a, and, and Blake and I have talked about it a lot. It's a, it's a whole new, if you teach a class like that, it's a whole new expectation. Yeah. Um, you have folks that are there face to face in the classroom, experiencing that traditional type of interchange. You have folks on Zoom who have, who have tuned in and, you know, we do a really, I, we work real hard to make sure that the folks in the classroom know that there are Zoomers out there and that Zoomers know that there are folks in the classroom so they can feel part of the same unit, not, not disjointed. And of course, the Arboretum, ever since, ever since uh, the classes have been taught, uh, the classes were always, always recorded and, and they made those, the recordings accessible to, the, to the, the, the people that took the class. So, so now uh, someone can sign up for an Arboretum class. They can come face to face. They can zoom in live, or they could choose to watch it um, at a later time. And you and I have talked about this: the idea that how do we how do we entertain ourselves on with a screen now? It's all streaming and it's all on demand. We decide yep. when we want to watch it. Whereas educational, um, uh, in, w observing the way education is going. Why are we surprised that some people may sign up for a class, pay good money for it, and never tune in live or never show up live, right? only to be able to watch it? Hey, I love the idea of being binge watched. I think that would be so cool. <laughs> yeah. sign, up, sign up for my plant, what's in the name nomenclature class, and don't, don't tune in and then, then binge it one night. You'll be, blood will be coming out of your ears. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, you know. So anyway, there, that, it's just that there's those that kind of flexibility. As educators, though, we have to get used to the idea that if there are 14 people signed up to be in the classroom and only three show up one night, that that's no reflection on the class, on the traffic. As much as it is, people have choices, and 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 they can they can they can employ those. Yeah. So I love that you're doing an eight week <laughs> plant taxonomy nomenclature oh. class. I, I, I have a talk, you know, uh, a rose by any other name, um, you know, and I start off with what, I don't know, 25 or 30 things that have a common name rose in them that go right. you know, everything right. from some, you know, uh, lower plants, you know, ferns, uh, uh, Selaginella is that kind of thing, all the way up to you know big trees. Um, the, and I gave it the first time to the garden, the Garden Writers Association, Garden Writers of America, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, I, based on a lot of the writing I've seen since then, um, it didn't stick. <laughs> but I tell people that knowing the names, knowing a little bit of Latin, really tells you a lot about about the the plants. Um, you know, where they grow, how they grow, what they might want to look like, that sort of thing. Well, I've taught a class at NC State now for almost 40 years. Um, it's called Home Horticulture. It's a, it's a, a service class in the department. Um, it's for non-majors. And in fact, um, if you're a student on campus, that fulfills a, an elective requirement called, <laughs> um, let's see, non-laboratory science class. And so you can you can guess the, the 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 kinds of majors that that frequent that that class, which is great because they've op many of them have picked their liberal arts major based on their their allergy to science and 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 just their level of interest. Uh, and so I've had forty years of practice. How do you teach a, a population of individuals who may not necessarily know? what's what's what they need to know about gardening right right and where do you start and, and i always like to start at the basics because you know, as gardeners i think we spend a lot of time asking how do i do this right yeah. it's the culture and um and before without asking um why am i doing this you know a little bit of the theory maybe a little bit of a botanical um framework and so that class has always been based on okay let's learn botany so that we can apply it to what we do in our own backyards, in right. our own, own home gardens. And um, the connection is not obvious. The relevance isn't obvious. And, and so that's why, you know, when, when we were coming up with this class on, you know, plant names, where do plants get their names? What can we learn from them? Why is it that plants have one, two, three, now even maybe four different kinds of names? 
And then, so what relevance does that have for me as a backyard home gardener right. if I want to grow pansies, right? And, um, and so um, the class is really devoted to um, giving some history. Where did, where did this come from? Talk about, you know, the botanical aspect of, you know, we don't just start talking about plant names. We start talking about how plants are classified. Right. right? Before we even get into what we call them, we're trying to figure out how we organize them. You know, and, and my biggest challenge in that class and what you can look forward to when you take it, y'all, is that, um, it, that I will always provide examples of why it's important to understand that if your goal is nothing but becoming a better backyard home gardener. Right. So that's, yeah. that's the goal. Well, uh, I won't get into it deeply, but that's a conversation I keep having with, other, with my peers in this mm -hmm. industry is taxonomy. Taxonomy is, taxonomies in general are a way of classifying, sorting things so our tiny brains can, right. can figure them out. And it was done, you know, long history, but you know, when it kind of got, came into the modern system, it was on, you know, the flower parts and things like that. And it was a way to say, okay, these plants are similar. These plants are similar. These plants are similar. And now it's really changed to evolutionary relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's almost become where we need, there's a, an evolutionary taxonomy, but a horticultural taxonomy because some of the DNA says these plants are the same thing. Right. And as a gardener, they're not. Exactly. <laughs> when you put them in the ground, they exactly. behave differently. Right. The right. people who look at, you know, the the DNA and the the cell structure and things like that don't always get that. So it's it really is fascinating. It's, and it's a really neat history when you get in there and right. you know the people that were involved. These are the you know, when you talk about the great scientific societies, yeah. this is what they were into. You know, this and uh, you know, trying to communicate with spirits and the <laughs> the beyond and things like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. The ones who were doing vivisection weren't, they weren't doing plants, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a fascinating thing. So I wanna ask you, okay. this is, I've, I've never asked this. Ooh. You, you, no names attached. Best story of a terrible student. <laughs> or not a terrible student, a, a student a who had, who was challenging or had, uh, had, had, Real potential to get better. <laughs> that's uh, Mark. That that's like asking. Um, that's like me asking you. You know, what's your favorite plant? Which we get a lot. You know, and um, I say, well, today my favorite plant is um, most challenging. You know, so I taught plant ID, plant identification in our two-year agricultural institute um, program, where you get a. Um, a applied associate's degree uh, for 27 years, taught plant ID. And um, I would, I, I would re, I would re-ask the question as to where, what was your greatest teaching challenge? And I would say, you know, teaching um, high school graduates who um, had no entrance requirement other than to have graduated from high school into college, yeah. uh, who have decided, who have, for whatever reason decided they wanted to go into turf grass management or into some, some aspect of horticulture, having to take a plant identification class where during the semester they would learn anywhere from 175 to 250 plants by their scientific name, by their common name, et cetera. And the level of motivation in those students that majored in turf grass management who were required to take that course um, perhaps um, translates into some of the most unique and interesting um, challenges with students because um, in that in that two-year program the first semester is is spent uh, oftentimes helping these young people learn how to go to college mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that have to in incorporate that and um, so um, yeah without naming names um, you know back then I don't know that our students this is between early 1980s and up to two 2002 or three, um, the, the sense of entitlement by uh, young people wasn't perhaps as um, prevalent as it is today. Or let me rephrase that because I don't wanna, I don't wanna throw today's generation under the bus because it, the students I have today are awesome, right? It's just they misbehave in different ways. That's all, you know, they, yeah. you know, when I first started teaching, if a student disengaged in class, they'd pick up the 
campus newspaper, <laughs> you know, and just start reading the campus newspaper. Now, you know, um, they're on their phone, you know, underneath the desk or even blatantly up on the, on the desktop, Blake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, and, and I have colleagues who've, who have said, oh, well, you know, students are so different today. They're not different. They just, they just use different ways to, to be good and different ways to, to, to not be good as students. So, uh, but uh, the turfgrass majors demanded relevancy for out of me. And that was, it was a good, it was a big challenge. It was like, okay, okay I'm gonna be the superintendent of this golf course. Why do I need to know these plans? Right. You know? And thankfully I had some graduates from that program who, who got their jobs based on their ornamental plant knowledge because they were working at country clubs where um, it, it, was more, it was about more than just managing good turf for golf. It had to do with the plantings around the clubhouse, around the, the grounds, uh, along the fairways, that type of thing. And, uh, and yeah. so I was able to provide relevance. And frankly, to me, that's probably the biggest, the biggest challenge of most, most of us teaching, whether we're teaching folks like you at home, um, in, a, in an arboretum class or even college students is if, if you can provide a, a, a good reason why yeah. that makes sense to them, then hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll buy into it. Now I did teach plan ID at a two year school and I had some of the same experience, although that was more people returning to um, school for a new career, which sure. those, those people are very um, motivated, motivated yeah. but yeah. we did have the turf students as well. But I was a TA um, teaching assistant in when I was in college for plant ID. And so I wanna know, were you as mean as the professor that I had who would, as we were walking around, we'd walk around and look at what plants we were gonna do the, the next week. So I, you know, me and the other graduate student could teach the labs, um, you know, when it was raining and snowing and he was sitting in his office. But as our professor and, other, and myself and another graduate student would walk around, he would sometimes, as we walked by a walnut tree, pick up a couple walnuts and put them in his pocket and then toss them on the ground underneath another tree with compound leaves. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, were, were you, you, I'm taking it you weren't, you weren't that quite that um, cruel. No, I, I guess if you want to call that cruel, it, it's, it, you know, I think in, in his own way, he may have been trying to, um, to pull out those, you know, um, minute, observational skills that are necessary to be, you know, proficient in plant identification. I don't know that I ever went to those lengths. <laughs> what I would do is I, I, would, I would find a, a, uh, a you know, just a, a red bud, Circus canadensis, but I'd find it in an environment where the leaves were incredibly small. Right. Okay, for whatever reason. And um, that would be the one that I would quiz them on. All, having seen, you know, when they went out on the plant walk, they saw the rank and file red bud with the, with the large leaves. And of course, this was to teach them, okay, you can't just say Chinese red bud has smaller leaves than, than, than our Eastern red, our American red bud, because in different environments, those, those characteristics are gonna, sure, are gonna change. Right. So I, I'd be known to make sure, okay, count the venation, right? If you don't count the venation, you can get, and invariably I'd take them to that red bud with the smaller leaves and they'd all call it Chinese red bud. And, uh, but, yeah. but to think that we're being devious, Mark, or trying to trick our students. Um, I can't say that I ever was. I was just trying to hold, hold them to a higher standard. <laughs> you know, I, so I, had, I taught my first uh, class since I've been at NC State. I have avoided it, I've avoided it. I love teaching, but it's, it's a lot of time to do it well. Yeah. And so I taught a very, very small graduate class on public garden administration and put the grades in. And um, one of the students got an A and I, apparently they can see the grade very soon after I put it in, because I got an email back <laughs> saying, well, can you provide me some feedback on why I didn't get an A plus? <laughs> <laughs> Did you provide that feedback? <laughs> I was really tempted to say, oh, I made a mistake, here's your A plus, because I, you know, she was very type A. Mm, yeah. um, Sounds you know, like type A plus. Home horticulture, <laughs> yes. Home horticulture is the only B I got in a horticulture no class. Um, I think I didn't take it seriously enough because uh, it was just yeah. filling out an extra horticulture elective right, and right, right, yeah, it was easy. Right. And I may have read the campus newspaper in, in class a bit. Uh, so, yeah. 
So um, Bryce, one of his, his passions, one of the things he did for ages here was take the students on, on tours. Mm. And I'm not gonna ask you about, about any of the shenanigans on the tours. I've heard a few stories, but, um, but just travel in general, something I, I know that, that you feel passionate about, yeah, but it's so. important, fulfilling, but also, I mean, for the students, especially it yeah. broadens the mind, but for anybody. So, you know, you visit gardens around the world, you visit um, these amazing places. What are, what are some of your, your tops? Um, either, either locations or events or gardens that, you, that you've seen? All right, before I actually answer that specific question, a comment about travel and the importance of travel, and, and this is really not so much a comment toward for undergraduate students in college or graduate students in college as much as it is for anybody that's interested in gardening. Um, the, much of the uh, decisions I've made in my own garden to do things or not do things have come from um, experiences I had in uh, private gardens, public gardens, more public than even private gardens, where because I went um, with a critical eye, got an idea, and then tried to apply that on a smaller scale. And, and you know, with the TV show, one of the things that, one of the goals and missions of the television show for years was, um, let me take you somewhere, show you something, uh, and help you understand what, to, what you need to be looking at uh, so that you can then take it back and, and apply it. And I'll give you an example. There's a great garden, and this is one of my favorite gardens um, in, uh, in North Georgia, it's, it's north of Atlanta by about 40 miles. It's a place called Gibbs Gardens where, where um, uh, Mr. Gibbs, a landscape contractor in Atlanta, buys a big swatch of land up in Ball Ground, Georgia. And if you've never heard of it, you, you, it's hard to even find on, on the map. Um, and, uh, and picked it based on a, a, a botanical garden he wanted, a private garden that he wanted to build. And, um, and this, this was the vision though. Um, he also built a big retirement home up there as well. Yeah. But the vision was he was gonna work that garden. He was gonna build that garden and he wasn't gonna open it to the public until he felt it was ready to be viewed. And so he worked that garden for 30 years before he opened it to the public, right? So when you go, when you go Jim Gibbs, quite, quite, I, don't, I, I hope he's still alive, but you go, you go into the parking area and you, you walk into the garden and to the left, you can picture this as a beautiful alley of river birch. Mm -hmm. And then you, you take a hard right to get through the welcome center and you go over what's called the bridge of flowers. And so there on the bridge, he's got hundreds and hundreds of um, coconut fiber uh, containers, both hanging on the railings and freestanding along the bridge. It's stunning in all annuals, combinations, all kinds of things. So one, what could you learn from that? Well, you can learn about what kinds of combinations of annuals you might put in a, in a, in a, planting, mm -hmm. in a planter. Second, you look at that and you go, I couldn't afford this. I don't have the space for this. What on earth? But when I saw that, I thought, well, I have a front porch and I have a railing and I can put I can put one of those on the railing and put one of the freestanding uh, containers over in the corner. And so the, I downsized the, 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 the project, but the application was exactly the same. Yeah. And so, so the idea of, you know, doesn't even matter. Go to any garden, large or small, United States, Canada, Europe, wherever, and, and just keep thinking about, okay, what. I see something I like, how, can I, how might I be able to take that and apply it in my own, in my own um, garden? So yeah, that. Now, favorite gardens? <clears throat> oh my gosh, I mean, why, why do you do this? <laughs> you know, I mentioned Gibbs and I wouldn't say it's way up there on the top. I mean, I think any English you know, garden I've been to- While you're thinking, yeah. my, my uh, first interaction with, with Jim Gibbs was back in 95. Oh my gosh. Because he was, he was building this, and I mean, this was, before it was ready to open, this was, he gave a tract, he was going to give a tract of land adjacent to the Atlanta Botanic Garden. That's what I worked no at kidding. Atlanta Botanic Garden. And things changed over time, and they wound up with a northern campus in Gainesville rather than, what, ball ground? Is that what you said? Ball ground. 
And I did go up there several yeah, times yeah. on this track, and we, we did some things up there. But, uh, but yeah, so, um, and it, it was crazy at the time when he was doing it. I was like, oh, this, this, this guy, yeah, right. And boy, when he opened it, it <laughs> he opened some eyes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, there are the cliche favorites, you know, Great Dixter, mm. Sissinghurst, you know, some of the, some of the UK gardens. Um, I, I was, uh, there, there's a school of horticulture in um, southeastern Scotland called the Threve School of Horticulture, which has a marvelous garden, but it's, it's also a, um, you know, it's a, it's a lovely, um, uh, typical Scottish walled garden mm -hmm. surrounded by grounds, but also a, 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 a professional school, you yeah. know, uh, which is interesting because, you know, if you want to, in England, if you want, if you want a career in, in, in uh, horticulture, you, you go to a trade school, you go to a right. horticulture school, you don't go to a, a university. And three school was one of those. So that was, that was kind of unique and, and, and interesting. Um, the, um, the, I, they're, they're a group of very unique and interesting gardens in Northern Italy um, on Lake Maggiore um, that, are, that, that are, are date back to barons and royals that, that, that are there on one, an island garden in the middle of a lake. I've and, been there, and yeah. You've been, Isola Bella, it yes. is, um, it, it, you put it, it is worth, it's worth going. You, have, you can't get to it by boat, except by boat. Um, but it, 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 it provides a totally different uh, um, uh, approach to, you know, if you, if you think of your typical ornamental garden from an English perspective, the, the, those gardens are very Baroque. <laughs> What you know. was fascinating to me as a plant guy, yeah. you know, I'm pure, you know, design, ah, who needs design? Put in enough different plants and it all looks good or it looks terrible. Um, you know, the great English gardens and collectors and, and, you know, there's some other great gardens, the, you know, collections, Gottenberg Botanic Garden. I had no idea how ahead of their time those gardens in Northern Italy were. Their, the, the plant collections they had blew me away yeah. stuff i mean yeah. things i'd never heard quite of quite remarkable and of course then you know and, and you're at the base of the the foothills of the the alps you know and here you have um uh mediterranean plants thriving because they're 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 in a garden in the middle of a lake right you know and uh and so that moderating effect of even a, a large a large um, uh, lake in northern Italy uh, was a is able to sustain a lot of plants that we couldn't even grow here. So it's it, that's quite unique. So have you been to the Yorkshire Arboretum? I have not. You have not. So I promised I would tell you a story about okay. about Earl Grey tea, which <laughs> my daughter says an, is an abomination because it has bergamot in there, and she says that's terrible. Yes. But Lord Hoyt owns the the manor adjacent to how hardwick hall mm -hmm. um which is an incredible collection of plants incredible and the yorkshire arboretum is kind of on that same property and and somebody we've had here many times to speak uh, john grimshaw runs the yorkshire arboretum um but back uh when um everybody was brewing their own bespoke teas at all these places uh, one of the early Earl Greys, uh, hmm. who the the um, the Viscount Hoyt uh, had a, a somebody from China um, brewed them a special tea that or blended a special tea that was supposed to be good with the water in that particular area. That's why it was blended the way it was. And you know they people say, oh, this is really good. Can can we sell your and I said, sure. Um, you know, if you've seen on Downton Abbey where, you know, they're not great business people sometimes. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, Twinings took it up. And, no you kidding. know, it wasn't protected by uh, the, the Earl's Grey. Um, so it, it went out into the popular press. But, but the current Earl Grey, uh, Lord Hoyt, is an avid avid plantsman. He's wow. traveled around the world um, collecting plants. Amazing, amazing um, rhododendron collection, especially wow. of kind of northwestern mm -hmm. uh, England. It's, it's worth the visit. And if you if you get in touch and you convince him you're a good enough plantsman uh, and he's in town, 
staying at, wow. at, at his place is not too oh, shabby wow. either. Wow. <laughs> That's very cool. You know, you talk about um, the uh, m mixing with the water. That almost sounds like, you know, some of the, the uh, single malt mm. um, scotches in, in Scotland and how the peat and the water all matter. Yes, yes. That, that's on the list for, you know, we do these tours uh, for the Arboretum and uh, a single malt uh, Scottish tour is, uh, is something that, that uh, may not be uh, too far uh, in the future. You might have people fi fighting you to go with you, <laughs> fighting over going with you. Well, I'm going to Costa Rica early in the new year. That's sold out no in kidding. three hours and 40 minutes. Wow. wow. People want to get out of town. People want to get out of town, yeah, yeah. for sure. It's fascinating. It's amazing. So, do we have questions? I, 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 you no, know, this isn't a, a stump the chump, but um, <laughs> why don't you? Why don't we just stick to ones that are really for Bryce about Bryce, not general gardening. Although, hold on. Before we get into the questions <clears throat> from people, in order to forestall some of them, most likely. We are looking at getting possibly as low as 11 degrees in the next couple of days. I think um, we probably have some questions about that. Probably so. Thoughts? My thoughts? Yeah, I've got, I've got um, probably 25 to 30 agaves in pots that I'm trying to decide what to, what to do with them. Uh, first of all, okay. <laughs> When it comes to cold weather, we, we live in a temperate region, right? And we like to push the envelope. We all love to push yeah. the envelope, all right? Not gardeners. So, but I think what happens is we get, I think we get um, uh, lax when it comes to understanding that, especially when you have two or three winters in a row where perhaps the low was in the teens and we never got in the single digits. And, and um, I, I, last time I checked, we were still Still zone seven, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, single digits aren't, you know, it's not like, oh my gosh, what just happened? And so I, I always say, as a gardener, death spells opportunity. And I am, I'm not going, I'm not going to bend over backwards to, um, I've got to be careful here because there are plants that people are emotionally connected to that I actually have some that I'm emotionally connected to. And sure. guess what? They're, they're going to get a special place inside my home, right? But um, the, the idea that, um, you know, and I blame the local meteorologists as well because you cover your plants. I, this covering your plants thing, I'm not exactly sure where that came from, uh, but uh, perhaps when we're talking like in the spring where the temperature may get to 29 or 30 mm -hmm. and no lower where a cover might help. But beyond that, you know, I have neighbors, if the temperatures are going to go down in the mid twenties, they're out covering their with sheets. And, and, uh, you know, I've told them it's just, it, it's a placebo at yeah. best. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd be more concerned about my pipes. I think my, right. my take the hoses off the spigots. I mean, as a gardener, those would be the, the first places I would start. And I guess I'm not trying to belittle it, but and having grown up in Western Massachusetts, you know, it's, it's been a while because, you know, we're, we're, you know, after a while, 45 is cold where before I was in a t-shirt, but, uh, <laughs> but I, it, I have a lot of plants in containers and I've already um, dug out, this is long before the chance of this cold was coming. I always dig out about three to five inches underneath, um, you know, of mulch and underneath a hemlock in the north, the northeast co corner of my house. So my house is, is, is one side. And then this, this area, all, all temperate plants that are in containers and borderline plants that are in containers go into that. Then I mulch around it and I forget about it. The only thing I worry about is whether or not we've had rainfall because, um, Wet pots are more, are actually better than dry pots when it comes to root temperature. Yeah, well, there's water in there. That's exactly. the heat sink. Exactly. Um, I, you know, we, I know I've heard you say this, um, and it's a common thing, especially here, is it's not always how cold it gets, but how it gets cold. Exactly. And so I'm, I'm always, 
you know, there are things we will lose here at the Arboretum because we really push the envelope and right. we've had some mild winters. You know, the, the begonias from Arunachal Pradesh that came through <laughs> one winter last year, maybe they'll be, uh, they'll yeah. be affected at, at uh, single digits. But we've had cold weather. It's cool. Now it's going to go from 50 some degrees down into the teens, and that's a big jump, but it isn't going from 70 degrees right. to 50 degrees right. down to freezing. Things right. are dormant. They've, they've shut down. And um, I'm with you. I will, there are some newly planted things I have that I will often, usually not till after Christmas. Christmas, I take my tree out and I cut all the branches off and I kind of keep them in a pile. And if it's going to get cold, there are a few things that I'll throw some branches over um, just for a little added protection. Sure. But um, for the most part, that's too much of a hassle, yeah. um, you know, and plus, which, you know, if I start doing it, if I've do, done this one, then I really Where ought to do stuff? this one, and then I really <laughs> ought to do this one. Now, I don't grow plants in containers almost at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they're in a container, it's a big container, and they are a hardy, woody plant, you, you know, you maples yeah. and, and, right. and conifers and things like that. Um, but the best advice that is just don't sweat it. I'm with you. Yeah. Something dies, great. There's a spot. If something dies, look around and see if there's anything else in that area you don't like right. and rip it out. <laughs> and While you're at it. That's yeah, right. I yeah, mean, yeah. that's, yeah. that's the agree. best. Okay, there aren't too many questions. Really, we could do, so somebody asked early on, speaking of birds, what are some common plants that we can grow that will have great seeds or berries to feed them? How about this, Bryce? Your top three shrubs for that benefit the birds. You know, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't go right to the answer when I get asked a question, but, but here's what I know about attracting birds with, with your garden, okay? Fruit and seeds should be probably the third or fourth priority. Your first priority should always be to create a landscape where birds can rest, where they can nest, and where they can seek protection. And that ultimately results in a multi-layered landscape where you have tall trees, you have medium-sized trees, because there are different birds that occupy these different layers of the landscape. And so, you know, I put bird feeders out, great, but if you don't have a place for those birds to, to go and rest, to, to find uh, protection, then they're, they're gonna be less apt to, to go there. So that's the first. The second is, if you don't have water, you're not, you, don't worry so much about the, the plants that are gonna attract the birds because um, water's, for all wildlife, water. It doesn't have to be a fancy water source. I still do just rank and file bird baths. In fact, I just cleaned two out today, filled them up and say, well, what about if they freeze? They freeze, you know, yeah. um, I, I, I'm, and, I, and you know what? I'm glad I'm not a bird. Actually, I, maybe I wish I was a bird because these birds, Go into these bird baths, the temperature of the water is just just short of being frozen, and, and they're in there without, without a wetsuit. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Now, I'm granted, I understand the feather thing, but their feet? Of course, <laughs> I, I, I've read about that. They don't have much in their feet, just enough to keep them moving as far as what they would feel. So that's, that's the second one. And then, okay, plants. Um, obviously, uh, so all the research says native plants um, feed native birds uh, better than non-native plants. Well, guess what? Better, what does better mean, okay? Um, we're trying to reestablish ecosystems that um, people live in. We live in contrived environments. Uh, the, the plants, that, the native plants that have fruit and, and produce seeds, obviously they're gonna support the bird population, without a doubt. Um, but what you don't read a lot about, and Mark, I think it, at, um, at uh, Ralston Blooms, we actually were talking with some yes. folks about this. What, what you don't read a lot about is all the research that, that lists the non-native plants with fruit that native birds in this region eat and, and enjoy and thrive on. Not that you would use them exclusively, just like you might not use natives exclusively, but, and uh, uh, forgive me for saying this, but you know, every once in a while, a cardinal likes to go out for Chinese and the, 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 the Chinese, um, uh, the Cornus Cusa fruit, a cardinal will perf will go to that before, it, and this is anecdotal. I'm just looking in my own yard, okay? I'm just, there wasn't, I can't find any research on this, but 
They'll go to that kusa dogwood before they'll go and eat the fruit of our native dogwood. Yeah, and I don't think they can, they haven't taken the, your, your taxonomy class, so they can't tell the difference, <laughs> as far not, as I can tell, yeah, between yeah. <laughs> Asian um, hollies and our native hollies. Down they go all. to look at the tag just to make but, sure it's a native. And the other yeah. thing I think always, and this is this will go back to all the time is, and it goes to what you were first talking about, is diversity. There are there birds go. that eat seeds of, of herbaceous perennials, you know, asters and things like that. There are birds that eat fleshy fruits. There are birds that eat um, insects that are right. coming to our plants. And it is, the minute you start going, I want this plant for this thing, you, which is fine, but if, you, if, if then you discount all these other things, um, you, you really lose out. It's that diversity because that's where you get those, those different layers. That's where you get um, the different birds that are coming in. That's where you get the different butterflies. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. amazing and, uh, what you can get if you start. Well, I think the other thing too is um, don't clean up your gardens um, until end of February. Oh, gosh, because we said that last week. That is hard for me. I know That's it's so hard. hard I know me. it's hard. My wife looks out the sunroom. She goes, when are you going to clean this thing up? It's starting to look even, you know, everything's turning brown. I'm like, no, I'm leaving everything because the birds really rely on on that under underground, that undercover as a way to, uh, you know, as a way to feel more uh, at home and, and protected in the landscape. Well, and you know, pollinators are huge. It's the same thing. Right. They, you know, are in those hollow stems and, uh, you know, in the litter down right. there that you want right. to get cleaned up and all that. So, so they're the three plants, Blake. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> there you go. That was a heck of an answer. I really like that. So. Um, okay. And there's really only one more question and it's not that hard, but okay. So the, the question is, what's the difference between Circus chinensis and Circus canadensis based on veins? And I think I ah. remember the answer to this one. If I'm not mistaken, the Chinese one has five veins and the Canadian one has seven. Is that right, Bryce? That's correct. Okay, and the way you remember that is ah. <laughs> China has five letters and, oh, br ooh, no, uh, okay. Brian Jackson taught us one for Canada, but it wasn't as good as the, a student in the class came up with a better one. O Canada has seven letters, so that's how you remember that. So. Yeah, it's yeah. The um, Circus canadensis, the 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 um, the American one is um, five to seven main veins, has palmate venation where the main veins um, go out like the palm of your hand, and then Circus chinensis has three to five. There you go. So you know you, you that that's more reliable than the size of the leaf. But, but what about? Circus occidentalis and Griffithii and I didn't uh, teach those Glabra. in my two-year plan ID class. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. Good stuff. Okay. You know, there's a funny story about plan ID. Um, Mike Durr was here at the Arboretum one day, and he ran into Paul Fonts. Now, Dr. Fonts was is a retired faculty member in our department, uh, botanically trained, and was hired to teach plant identification uh, at NC State, and taught for over 30 years. Beloved by his students, but a botanist at heart, not a gardener, not a horticulturist. He's a card carrying botanist. And so he taught plant ID as a card carrying botanist, right? Now, and of course, Mike Durr, you know, so the two of them are out in the garden and, and Mike's walking along with Paul and he, he points to a plant. I can't even remember what the plant was, but he points to the plant and he says, he's, uh, oh no, fonts says to Durr, so how do you distinguish between that and this in the, within that genus? And Durr goes, well, I just look at him. You know, and I just look at it, I take it in, and I, I kind of get what, and then this one just looks different. And, and Dr. Font said, well, that's unacceptable. Now, we're talking to a botanist, a botanist who measures the distance from the base of, of, a, of an anther, from the base of, a, of an anther to the filament, and uses that as, as oh, data yeah. to distinguish between you know, definitely, you know, Paul was way before any kind of chemical or genetic uh, taxonomy, oh, yeah. right? It all had to be documented and measured. And so um, he said, well, that's unacceptable. And Mike said, well, how do you tell the difference? That was the wrong question to ask a card carrying botanist because Paul spent the next 30 minutes <laughs> explaining to him down to the distance from one, one node to another on that. So well, to go full circle, <laughs> When I taught plant ID, not as a TA, but when I taught it myself, and I had been a professional and done this, I went, got, was getting ready to, to, you know, putting my things together for my first class, and 
you know, yeah, make some how how you what you're going to say, you know, so that people remember. Right. And I looked at a dogwood and said, "That's a dogwood," <laughs> and I can I can generally tell a dogwood even if it's one I've never seen before. How do I know it's Cornus Florida, our, our native dogwood? How do I know Cornus Cusa just from looking at it? Right. Now, if you point them out, if Paul Fonz points them out to me, you know, I, I know them. Sure. But having to go back and say, how do I know this and how can I communicate that without relying on whether the ovary is, uh, you know, sub superior or Right. Inferior or sub inferior <laughs> or, you know, how how do I do that um, when it doesn't have flowers or fruit? One other little story about Paul Fonts. For a while after he retired, Paul would come out and collect herbarium samples for the um, NCSU herbarium. You know, he'd, he'd take them, he'd press them and document them. And there was something here, and now I can't remember what it was. This was probably a decade ago uh, that we were going to get the first flower on finally. And it was something, it was maybe a a camellia relative, it was maybe a, a, a tucheria or polyspora or something. I was gonna have a nice white flower on there. And it's just getting ready, just getting ready. Oh no. Time I went out to see it, that one flower, he had cut it and pressed it because that's what you want. You know, <laughs> if you're getting herbarium samples, you want a, a flower or fruit, you don't want just the foliage. And so he'd gotten it right, <laughs> right on time. <laughs> was out there with my camera and ready to go, yeah. but. Um, fantastic. All this talk about taxonomy, um, folks. I don't want to. I don't want to frighten you relative to this class. So this is this is the blatant pitch for the for the class coming up. Um, it's not a plant identification class. Okay. Um, you say, okay. Well, then, is it a botany class on plant plant classification? Yes, but um, the 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 bottom line is that all all the examples that are given uh, relate to how you and I might choose to select, or once we've selected, choose to understand the plant that we've got. And to understand, and this is really important because in a lot of classes I teach, this is very important. There's a lot of companies trying to sell you things and, and that they're not lying when they try to sell you things, but um, if you understand, then you can, you can save a whole lot of money and um, if that's not a motivation, I don't know what it is. Exactly. But anyway, no um, and the other thing is we use the F word in that class a lot, and that's that's fun. We 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 make it we make it fun, and hopefully Blake, you could attest to the fact that yeah. our classes do tend to be a lot of fun. They are fun. Yeah, they we are. have a good time. They are. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bryce. You're this welcome. is always a pleasure. I did leave off one of the main parts of your your resume, uh -oh. uh, the most important one. I do want to say, twice Bryce has stepped into the breach. Ooh. Uh, here at the Arboretum, sometimes for longer than he thought <laughs> uh, he was going to be and, and really has kept the, the Arboretum going kind of in some, some times of uncertainty. So I want to put that out there because that really is the pinnacle of, of well, the career, I'm sure. Um, the, the, I, I got off the plane for my interview at NC State back in um, May of 1981 and the department had Augusta Hertog um, who, who who facilitated JC's dream by by uh, being his being the cheerleader for this project. First place he brought me, I got off the plane. He brought me right here, yeah. and so this place um, has um, uh, a long history for me, and um, I have a great love for it, uh, and uh, just thrilled to be part of it. So, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Yeah, uh, it's been it's been great. Um, you come to the classes and continue the conversations. You can tell from this, it's, it's never, it's not, here's some taxonomy. It's, okay, before I answer that question. Uh, so it's, it, it yeah. which brings it all home to you, I'm, I'm sure. Okay, so. so thank you so much, Bryce, thank for you. being here with us today. Thank you, Mark, for leading this conversation. It was fun and enjoyable, as all of Bryce's class are. They are absolutely fun. Bryce has a, as you can see, he has a good sense of humor and he does keep it light but also really informative like you have a good time and you go home having a greater understanding of the world which is just a beautiful thing so thank you all for being here today thank you for coming to our last midweek of the year we will be back on january the 4th with january gardening tasks to let you get a sense of what you could be doing in the month of january and i guess we'll see you then y'all have a happy holidays and a happy new year y'all take care <laughs>